Ladies and gentlemen, could we, could we please stop the discussions over there? We want to continue with our sessions and everyone who has the need to individual discussions, please leave the room or stay, which is the better alternative. Excuse me again. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to either leave or stay in the room? <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our sessions on critical raw materials. Why do we have that session? Because energy has told us in recent months after the war with Ukraine, that you should not be too dependent on a single supplier. And I, as a German, know what I'm talking about. We need diversification, and that is the more true when it comes to lithium, to cobalt, to copper, to nickel, to vanadium, to rare earths which we all need for the daily devices uh, of our modern life. And therefore, this subject has an enormous geopolitical meaning. If we are not able to secure affordable, reliable, raw materials, our industries cannot survive. And therefore, we have decided with Thierry de Montbrial and uh, Songnim Kwon and others to put this on the agenda. And we have great experts, two here and two online with us. The first I would like to introduce to you is a scholar, a scholar who has worked for 40 years on these subjects, much before they became popular, and that is uh, uh, Philippe, who is with us, and uh, Philippe Chamin is a professor at uh, Université Paris Dauphine. Uh, he is uh, author of 40 books uh, on economic issues, and he is the founder and head of Cyclope, and Cyclope has this handbook out every year since 36 years. And it's a, a documentation, a handbook on the latest developments in the field of commodities and raw materials. So there is hardly a better expert on this issue uh, in Europe than Philippe. Philippe Chalmin, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much and I'll try to be as short as possible. Do you know, by the way, uh, which is a commodity which has had the steepest rise in prices in 2022? It's not natural gas, it's lithium. A ton of lithium carbonate today costs around $80,000, when two years ago, it was between 10 and 15 thousand dollars, multiplied by seven to eight. If you take nickel, you spoke about nickel. Nickel in the early days of March uh, this year, uh, it jumped for some time at 100 thousand dollars per ton. And another a mineral which is important in the same field of electric batteries, of course, graphite. One doesn't speak much about graphite. Its price has risen by 33% only in 2022. All this, of course, is linked to energy transition needs. And that's why we speak now of a new category, which we call the CRM, critical raw materials. Uh, in Cyclop, we have uh, devoted a chapter on what we call electric materials, where we do put lithium, cobalt, graphite, and some other. What is a, commodity, a, a critical raw material? It's definitely a material which is strategic for economic development. And of course, it depends on technologies. So 
uh, if we had had that classification some years or centuries ago, it would have been very different. For example, the critical raw materials in the antiquity was tin, because tin and copper, you made bronze, and with that, you could make arms. But at the end of the 19th century, tin was still a critical raw materials, because with that, you were making tin plate, and tin plate was very useful to uh, manufacture the boxes uh, in order to keep food. And by the way, the first uh, contract on the London Metal Exchange at the end of the 19th century was not copper, it was tin. Now it's very clear that uh, critical raw materials, you find them in electronics, uh, in batteries and so on. By the way, tin is back right now because it's used for electronic soldering in the chip industry. Today, uh, when we look at uh, critical raw material, of course you have all what is needed for batteries, that is lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel. I would probably add rare earths, which are used in wind technologies, platinum in hydrogen, and some others. By the way, the extraordinary thing with energy transition is that everything was decided without a, a thought of what could be purchase planning. Uh, we love all uh, solar energy, for example, but so far, 80% of solar panels are coming from China, with silicium being the big problem. It was more or less the same thing for electric batteries. And I remember about 10 years ago when a French company was developing a fleet in Paris of, vehicle to, of electric vehicle to hire, they later contacted me, where could we find some lithium? That was the question. Today, if you just look at batteries, which are probably the hottest uh, pr uh, product at the moment, uh, for cathode, lithium, uh, if I take the consumption, the demand in 2022 today, and the demand which is forecasted for 2030, the needs for lithium should be multiplied by 490%. For graphite, it should be 554%. If you go on the other side for the anode, the needs for cobalt, 172% more, and nickel, only 96%. But when you think about electricity, to carry electricity, you need, of course, copper. And uh, you see that, in fact, even old metals are now the very hot commodities. In fact, we are facing two problems. The, the problem of reserves is not really a problem. When we speak about lithium, uh, the production of uh, equivalent lithium metal is today 100,000 tons. There are 22 million tons of reserves. Same for cobalt, same for rare earth. Rare earth, uh, the production today is around uh, a bit less than 300,000 tons, and uh, reserves are 120 million tons. The problem is not there. The problem is mining, and mining with a dependency on some areas. 50% of the reserves of lithium are in the triangle of lithium, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. 60% of cobalt is in the democratic, put it into bracket, Republic of Congo. And uh, when you look at platinum, uh, at palladium, vanadium, you look at Russia and uh, South Africa. It's clear that on the mining side, we have a problem, which is today not enough mining investment. We should have, on the overall mining industry, around uh, 160 billion of investment dollars of investment each year. Last year, well, last year, uh, which has been completed, that is in 2020, world investment in mining was only $80 billion. So half 
what should be needed. And you know, as I do, that in many countries, it's very difficult to open a mine. To open a mine in Europe is a problem. Uh, the biggest uh, reserve and potential producer of lithium in Europe should be Serbia. And for the moment, everything is closed. Uh, in France, we just discovered some lithium. Uh, but before exploiting it, we'll have to, uh, uh, to have all the green hurdles that you can imagine. So <coughs> it's really, in many countries, very, very difficult to open a mine. Uh, by the way, the Greens love to put us on electric vehicles, but they don't want us to produce lithium. Try to see if there is not a problem in their mind. But mining is one thing, metallurgy is another thing. You have the mineral, you have to transform it into a, a usable product. Uh, uh, for a long time, rare earths were not rare. Uh, and uh, the center of rare earth metallurgy, by the way, was in France. Today, we have all exported, we have delocalized our environmental problems and of course, rare earth, you know now, is about 80% uh, uh, produced in China. Uh, when you look at the position of China, by the way, as far as metallurgy is concerned, today, China produces 60% of lithium, be it carbonate or hydroxide, 65% of cobalt metal, 70% of graphite, and only 30% percent of nickel. So what kind of solutions can we have? It's clear that today all car manufacturers are trying to build joint venture, uh, General Motors as one with Valley for nickel, with uh, Lever for, with, uh, for lithium. Tesla has just uh, uh, taken some participation in New Caledonia. It was even said that Tesla could buy a, minor, a minority stake in Glencore, the world's biggest invest, uh, miner and trader in, um, in minerals. Uh, of course, we have the possibility of developing recycling, which will be important. Remember that uh, for normal cars, which are with lead batteries, uh, more than 60% of world lead is secondary lead that is recycled one. Uh, but in fact, it's clear that we are facing potential deficits in uh, uh, the horizon of 2030-2040. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that will be perhaps for lithium, perhaps for cobalt, more certainly for more basic products like copper or tin. And in fact, uh, uh, we are back to uh, antiquity, uh, to the time when uh, copper plus tin were uh, making bronze. Uh, your German, both of you, remember that the copper trade made the fortune of Austria, yeah. of the Habsburg monarchy and the Fugger trade company. What is important to my mind, and I will conclude on that, is that uh, uh, it's important, what is strategic, it's important to anticipate and to plan. I will give you an example of a perfect uh, irrational decision. The decision by the European Parliament to ban all gasoline and diesel powered cars by 2035. It's stupid, it's counterproductive, both on the fact that we don't have enough lithium on that reason, the time of mining, it takes 10, 15 years, so we will lack the, uh, the production of, leak, uh, of lithium necessary, and we will probably have some problem for cobalt and others. And by the way, all the, those electric cars will be run by power, which will be perhaps derived from coal. Just to finish, remember that uh, quotation from a French poet, Eluard, was saying that you should uh, never look at the past with today's eyes, you must not imagine the futures with today's technologies. Thank you very much, Philippe. I, I, I wish my, my kids could uh, study in Paris Dauphine and hear you <laughs> with so much power and so much clearness.
very great uh, uh, introduction. Next speaker is Peter Handley. <coughs> uh, Peter uh, is head of energy intensive industries, raw materials, and since recently also hydrogen uh, in the Direction Générale for internal market and industry. So he is basically Mr. Raw Material of the European Union. And what Philippe is in the academic world, he is in the world of the EU and the institutions of the EU. So we're, we're very happy to have you. You had uh, important positions uh, before. Uh, you were head of policy coordination in the uh, energy union. Uh, you did a uh, lot of work also in the British government. And you are one of the few Brits that I know who speaks French, uh, who has been studying at the uh, ENA in France, and uh, I'm sure you're looking with great uh, uh, excitement to today, tonight's uh, evening football match between France and Britain. But before you have to have a duty and tell us in 10 minutes what is the EU's policy concerning these problems that have just been described. Please, Peter. Thank you, thank you very much. And may I first say how much um, I appreciate being invited back and also the, um, the wonderful, uh, very challenging uh, introduction from Professor Shellman. I think it sets us up for a good panel debate. Since, since I was here a year ago, everything's changed. Um, notably, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has created a whole new uh, global paradigm, which has uh, had its impacts on supply chains. And it's also been one of the drivers for action by a number of um, countries and regions around the world, we, we amongst them. But look at what's been happening. The Americans have been rolling out their uh, Inflation Reduction Act, their Infrastructure Act, and uh, their defense um, procurement and stockpiling. The Japanese have been updating their Economic Security Act and reinforcing the powers of JOGMEC. Canadians have just rolled out a draft critical mineral strategy and just a few weeks ago decided to eject Chinese investors from three uh, critical raw material projects inside Canada. And um, on the international front, my team and I have been participating in the new initiatives set up by the International Energy Agency in its Critical Minerals Working Party. We're taking an active part in the Minerals Security Partnership established by the US State Department and also in the new Paris Peace Forum call for action on global governance for critical minerals. Turning Turning to our own uh, plans in the European Union, shortly after Russia's invasion, the European Council had a reflection at Versailles and the declaration came out saying that the European Union had... We don't hear you right now. There is a, a problem. Uh, Peter, we can't hear you. Perhaps you have to... Uh, get restarted, and uh, uh, since uh, you are not available right now, I would uh, think we should come here back to the panel. Uh, Peter, excuse me for this, but we have to make use of that time, and I would like to introduce, uh, you're coming back, I'm sure, uh, and Technic will, will uh, make that possible. But uh, I would, would come back to the panel here and introduce to you Jonathan Cordero. Uh, Jonathan is head of corporate business development of a great company. It's called the Eurasian Resources Group, ERG. That is a, a natural resource conglomerate operating in Europe, in Kazakhstan, in Russia, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, Congo, South Africa, 19 billion in assets, 7 billion uh, revenues, uh, 85,000 employees, so it's a huge company. And, uh, well, if we talk about diversification of raw materials, the ERG is one of the first addresses to turn to because they are all over the world and not only concentrated in a few countries. So, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great to have you here. Thank you, Friedbert. 
It's an honor to be here with all of you and talking about a topic that is not only very close to my heart, but also at the core of everything we do at ERG. Um, COP27 is a testament of our endeavors reinforcing the intent of our society to decarbonize, to make the world a better planet for the ones that come after us. And uh, every week we can hear about new commitments, both from the private as well as from the public sector, uh, to net zero. Um, some of which we heard very ambitious goals, um, the transition towards electric vehicles. Let's appreciate where we have come as a society. I think we can be proud of ourselves um, and how united we as a society are in the move towards uh, decarbonizing. The harsh reality, however, is that the metals required to make this transition happening are coming from an industry that historically has suffered from a very bad reputation due to social and environmental issues. And the even bigger problem is that the commodities needed, as we just heard, and we got a very good wrap up of what is needed in the numbers, simply do not exist. Let me be more precise. They do not exist. The metals itself exist, subsurface, untapped, undiscovered, underdeveloped. We need, to, we need to quickly expand the production, and that's where we're going to struggle uh, most in our industry, to hit the net zero global emission goals by 2050, and we heard some about 2030 already, or 2035. We will need to produce, on average, six times more material than we'd produce today. This means, I mean, it's a very abstract concept, what does 6x mean? It means that 336 new mines predicted currently in development will all together need to come online and start producing to supply the materials needed, lithium, copper, cobalt, and so on. Recycling rates itself are low. Um, yes, the segment in supply is exponentially growing, but will not substitute primary mining in the short term. Just ask yourself, how many smartphones do you have unused in your own drawer at home? We are on the verge of a decade-long super cycle, and despite some recent setbacks that we had this year and some disruptions, the fundamentals have never been stronger. Yet our industry suffers from a variety of challenges ahead of us. Depleting resources, deteriorating grades, uh, the mines existing will eventually come to a halt. Going concern does not exist in our industry. The capital markets are failing junior miners to provide sufficient capital to take entrepreneurial risk and go to untapped territories and make the discoveries needed. And the increased focus from investors towards ESG standards leads to funds being not diverted towards the mines that need to be developed that are in countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Unless investors face the fact that the materials needed will not come from G7 countries, the important mines that need to be developed will be continue to be disregarded and not go online, which puts all of our plans and great missions at risk. We face logistical bottlenecks that are exacerbated by geopolitical tensions, and we spoke about this a lot today. And our industry struggles to attract young talent against the competition of shiny tech companies, space discovery, or the financial sector. I personally cannot think of any more industry that is more purpose-driven in making an impact on the world. And um, I think we need to improve here a lot. Our industry is not very good in adapting new technologies and innovating quickly enough. We are behind the curve and notoriously risk-averse. And last but not least, we can still learn a lot about marketing ourselves. Most people do not realize that in most of the operations, we are the only employer. We take responsibility for the people in our countries, in the host communities. We are the ones that build the roads, the electricity, the water supply, the schools, the hospitals, and very often also the stadiums. So let's make mining sexy again. 
The global battery transition is the largest purchase order in history, probably only comparable with the uh, Industrial Revolution some 200, 300 years ago. Trillions of dollars will have to be invested in making our plants happen. Yet, we face, especially in critical minerals, that resource nationalism increases. Parallel value chains are being built in several countries with several nations to capture value locally. The value creation itself is very unevenly distributed among the value chain. Take your example of a typical smartphone which costs you $1,000. The materials used in that is typically around $150 to $200. $2 of this is the price of cobalt. The Democratic Republic of Congo accounts for 70% of the production and holds about half of the reserves globally. That gives you an understanding of how, where the value is allocated. The global battery transition gives us the opportunity in creating a more balanced and fair distribution of value between the developed and the developing countries. And with the increase of demand and the fast need for ramping up production, ESG-related risks increase at the same rate. Where states and national policy makers find its natural boundaries, global market participants need to take responsibility. Responsibility to protect our environment, responsibility to enforce human rights, responsibility for the host communities that we operate in. In short, transparent and responsible sourcing cradle to grave. And this means leveling the playing field by agreeing with all market participants with binding rules of engagement for responsible sourcing. This is a commitment that end customers demand from us, and they are more than right in doing so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's, that's very important that you remind on, on, uh, on this. And uh, well, I think it was a great overview. Uh, I just heard that we will have Peter later on, but uh, I would like now to uh, turn to Ingvil Smeins Tuborg Gjede uh, from Norway. Uh, and here we have an incumbent in the sphere of uh, raw the, materials, of critical the mission, raw materials. The mission that we have ahead of us is so big, there's no competition in mining. There's so much work for <laughs> all of a, us. It's a huge company already established. And here is uh, a wonderful new company uh, from Europe uh, called Norge Mining. Norge is for the second time partner of the World Policy Conference. And I welcome you wholeheartedly, Ingvil. You have been a Norwegian Minister for Petroleum and Energy. You also have been Minister of uh, uh, Public Security in your country. And now you bring all your experience in government uh, and also in the oil and gas business uh, to Norge Mining, which has had a, a number of, of, which has found uh, big deposits in Norway, and that is in Europe, which uh, uh, now should be exploited, and we want to learn more about that very exciting endeavor. So the floor is yours, Ingvil. Thank you so much. I hope the technology will, will manage, you know, the transportation from Norway to, to Abu Dhabi. Last year, I was participating in per person which was in any aspect a much better solution than participating digitally, of course. I am mentioning this in particular because December is a very cold month here in Norway and I'm freezing sitting here in my own home office with electricity prices going through the roof. So I am emphasizing the climate in Norway for such an audience. Why am I doing that? Well, let me take a few steps back. Much of the focus last year's, this last year's, and rightly so, have been on mitigating the worst effect of environment from energy production and the transition to low carbon and sustainable alternatives. This approach, however, risks overlooking some crucial issues. How to bridge the gap to a sustainable future while simultaneously meeting the ever-increasing demand for energy Living in Europe, I will give you the examples from the same continent. 
it is an energy crisis in Europe these days. Short-sighted European energy policy made it painful for all of Europe when Putin invaded Ukraine, leaving energy security back on everybody's lips. The solution seems obvious. In the short term, coal-fired plants power are reopened and the life of nuclear power plants is extended. And in the longer term, more wind and solar plants and battery factories will become even more important. Thus, the paradox arises. Europe will go from a fossil to a renewable energy system, risking that this new energy system will be much more dependent on China and Russia than the current system. The reason why? Well, it's minerals. A renewable, a renewable energy system is highly dependent on minerals, minerals defined by the EU as critical. Without these, the European economy will come to an abrupt halt. The green shift increases this dependency. As you all have been speaking about, a wind power plant needs nine times more minerals than an equivalent gas fire plant power plant. And an electric car needs six times more than a fossil car. These minerals are hardly mined in Europe, as you also have stated in the panel. Both Russia and China are major exporters. The crisis created by the invasion of Ukraine is well known. But in the event of a, a hope not conflict with uh, China, Chinese exports of CRMs will become a powerful weapon. The continent could be plunged into a crisis that turns the current energy crisis in a pale shadow. The struggle for access to minerals is also international foreign and, pol foreign and security policy. It is a conflict the West is not well prepared for. The West is even more dependent on Russian and Chinese minerals than on Russian and Chinese energy. As the former Minister of Public Security and the Petroleum and Energy, and now the present member of the Norwegian Defense Commission, I'm very aware of the challenges I have presented and you have talked about and that we're going to talk about in this session. I'm also aware of the highly important natural resources we are blessed to have in Norway. Oil and gas, abundance of hydropower, we are paying for it by bad weather conditions though, and huge resources of different minerals. Minerals defined at the list of EU as CRMs, and I'm sure Peter will uh, be uh, talking a little bit about those in, in a little while. Currently, Europe relies on imports for these materials, which brings supply chain vulnerability and geographical risk. As a result, the EU wants to increase in the European production and processing of such minerals. It should be noted that currently, Europe consumes about a quarter of the world's raw materials, but produces only about 3%. As already mentioned some sentences ago, the green energy transition to deliver a carbon neutral economy is critical raw material intensive. The global shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy can only be achieved through the mining of metals and minerals, playing the key role in green energy production and storage. So far, we, the company in which I'm a board member at Nordic Mining, have completed more than 72,000 meters of drilling and in summary, the exploration work has been tremendously successful in that we have discovered at least at, and published two world-class resources of phosphate, vanadium, and titanium, making up just about 10 to 13 percent of our uh, entire potential. I would like to underline that the approach we have taken to the project. And this is of utmost importance to us and to Europe and to the mining industry is to embrace the highest standards of environmental and other behaviors. Alignment with the International Sustainability Programs, ESG and SDG compliance and disclosure guidances are central to our strategy for becoming a responsible, a responsible mining and processes business. The E argument 
for increasing the production of raw materials in Europe has never been stronger, nor need more urgent. Phosphate, vanadium, and titanium are all on the list of CRMs, and they have all been found in our licenses in Norway. Phosphate is very much uh, a case in this point. I had to mention this because it was not mentioned before. Phosphate was added to the list in 2014 and has remained on the list ever since. It is concluded because of its key role in the agriculture industry in the production of fertilizers and for the food security. Almost all of around 95% of phosphate produced is used in fertilizers. So phosphate is absolutely central to the security and of food supply. But phosphate is also increasingly important in the green energy transition, as mentioned. Owing to its use of LFP batteries, such as electric vehicles and static energy storage, China is the world's biggest producer of phosphate of today, followed by Morocco, the US and Russia. The war in Ukraine has weaponized natural resources, particularly energy, but also phosphate. The conflict also has weaponized grain supply, which further threatens food security, which will have effect on a broader scale. EU has historically improved, imported most of its phosphate from Russia. The invasion of Ukraine has created an urgent requirement to prevent dependency on Russia. There could be, couldn't be any better time to develop the phosphate industry in a stable environment in the heart of Europe, in, Nor in Norway. It will create security of supply in Europe and beyond, thereby contributing to food security and positively also reflect a thousand miles away. And I also have to mention that Norway's resources would last 50 years and beyond. The vast resources of phosphate in Norway could underpin the emergency of a European LFP battery industry. So let me conclude and come back to me starting talking about the outside temperature here in Norway. The energy crisis we are experiencing now are to be followed by a much more widespread crisis, CRMs. Without our own mining industry, Europe is building its renewable energy system on Chinese and Russian soil. And I think that should worry all Europeans. And thank you so much for having this topic in this conference. Well, we thank, thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you. We thank you, Ingvild, for, uh, for your time. And uh, we do hope that, uh, that what you have started with, with Norge Mining will, will uh, get stronger and stronger. And I uh, use this to get back to Peter. We interrupted you, or you, you were interrupted by, by the internet. Uh, and uh, of course, we don't want to uh, ask you new questions. You should, first of all, uh, finish your remarks. But perhaps you can also take in what, what Ingwil just said, and I, I saw you listening. Norway is not a member of the EU. Is it nevertheless considered a European country which could be under the uh, support and the legislative uh, approaches of the European Union as it definitely helps us to get less dependent on Chinese and Russian resources, as we just heard. Please, Peter. Happy yes, that you are uh, back. And apolog apolog apologies for the uh, loss of internet connection. Uh, just to answer that question, indeed, Norway is a very close and trusted partner of the European Union. It's a member of the European Economic Area. And um, I'm not sure whether you, I reached the point in my opening remarks to say that we're currently finalizing our negotiations on a strategic partnership with Norway, covering critical raw materials and the batteries value chain. And on top of that, of course, we're working very closely with Norway on the supply of, of gas. Um, and uh, I, I see this continuing. We're about to also conclude a EU-Norway Green Alliance covering a much broader range of planet and energy but uh, going back to where I think I, I lost my connection, the key thing is that um, the European Union has woken up to the imminent uh, danger it faces of not being able to achieve its energy and climate goals, as well as its defense and aerospace and digital goals, unless it really 
gets to grips with um, eliminating its strategic dependencies on, on far too few foreign suppliers for many of these critical minerals at different stages in the value chain. So as previous speakers have said, it's sometimes a challenge at, at the mining level, but much more often it's a challenge at the processing and refining stage. And we've actually got a mandate from the European Council to take much more ambitious action to secure our supply and to clean up the whole value chain. And so in September, Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen announced that we're going to prepare a European Critical Raw Materials Act. And that's the reason I'm not with you uh, in Abu Dhabi today, because every day counts. We're due to produce this legislation in March next year. So it gets through while we still have this European Parliament and this European Commission. And the purpose is to really identify what we're going to be concerned about. In fact, we're going to be going beyond critical raw materials and talking about those which are particularly strategic for the technologies that we've decided we need to uh, develop fast. We're going to be looking at how we can encourage member states to do much more systematic exploration. We're going to look at how we can develop sustainable mining. We're going to look at how we can reinforce the refining and metallurgical stages of the value chain. And we're going to be linking up the recycling phase with the refining stage. And we're also going to be looking at how we can recover waste, uh, recover critical <coughs> raw materials from mining waste. And we're going to look at the investment tools we need to deploy to make this happen. We're going to look at how we can streamline permitting without making any weakening of environmental and social protections. And uh, we're going to be looking at standard setting and uh, trying to push the circularity and recycling targets as much as we can. And that's just on the domestic side, because uh, as the president says, a lot of this is about building our own capacities, to reduce our strategic dependencies. But we're also going to seek to diversify our external supply. We're already doing this. Last year, we negotiated agreements with Canada, which has already generated a, a large number of major investments. We also last year negotiated with Ukraine, and we're going to use this partnership as one of the building blocks for reconstruction of the country once uh, Russia's brutal invasion is over. And uh, this year at COP27, President von der Leyen signed uh, agreements on critical raw materials with both Kazakhstan and uh, Namibia. So apart from the one with Norway, which is currently about to be finalized, we've just started talks with Greenland. and. Uh, there'll be news about other strategic partnerships in the course of next year. And that's in addition to our work jointly with partners in the Mineral Security Partnership. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. That sounds very encouraging. Uh, and the, the picture I get here from all what you say is the consciousness now is there. Uh, action will be taken, strong actions from the European Union. We have... Uh, strong established players, new players, and uh, I think that gives me m more optimism uh, than uh, on the energy front for the time being. But uh, uh, you have asked for the floor and, and want yeah. to comment. Uh, Philip, I please. just wanted to comment because uh, we've, uh, we focalize a bit on uh, uh, strategic raw materials uh, for uh, energy transition and so on. And uh, what Hing uh, said about phosphate is uh, pretty important. Uh, it's clear that among all necessary materials for the future of humankind, there is one which can't be substituted. Uh, all metals, at one point or, no, or another, you can substitute one by another. I can substitute a bit cobalt by nickel and so on. Well, sometime. So if there is one product which you can't substitute, which you need for crops, for the development of crops, it's phosphates. And phosphates, that's very, very important. For the moment, I didn't consider it as such a, a dangerously strategic materials because we have a chance, uh, a good part of phosphate reserves. And the first uh, and the biggest producer of phosphate is uh, a fairly friendly country. It's Morocco. So for the moment, we don't have too much problem. But as far as uh, 
uh, fertilizers are concerned, if I have not a concern with phosphate, I have one with ammonia, so natural gas, and a last one with potash. And our, um, uh, our potash in Europe comes from two very nice countries, which are, which are Russia and Belarus. So don't forget fertilizers, uh, uh, which is not a, a high technology industry, but which is just necessary uh, to, al to allow us uh, and to allow 10 billion people to it by the end of the okay. century. But, but Philippe, as far as I understood, uh, uh, Ingvil has just mentioned that uh, you have found uh, big deposits, especially of phosphate in Norway. Could you, could you tell us how much is that? And what is very interesting, I think, when could they go online? I mean, when could you go online with a production? You have a timetable uh, from finding to, uh, to the production. When can the EU and others uh, benefit from, from what you're doing there? Thank you so much for the question, and that's why we're so happy for the collaboration and the work that uh, Peter and, and his people is doing, because they are pushing not only EU, but also the Norwegian government to have the licenses and the patents and everything to come to, together to do this as soon as fast as uh, possible. For our concern, it's uh, only the governmental issues and the authorities that are, you know, prolonging the, the phase, but it has to be taken in, in the steps that that's needed to do it in a sustainable way. But when it comes to sustainable issues, because I, I really uh, um, support the, the arguments that, you know, we, we don't want mining industry in Europe, but what's very good in, in the findings we have, which is approximately 70 billion tons of phosphate and vanadium, quite huge resources, it's open pit mines, uh, is that we have a highly educated people. It, it's down south in Norway, so we don't have the Sami issues. It's also found in a region where uh, the oil and gas industry is highly developed. It's just outside, uh, outside Stavanger, which is the uh, oil and gas capital, if you can say that in Norway. Uh, so the, the stakeholder engagement and contribution to this, this is, this is very good. Uh, we have a very good, in, excellent infrastructure around the findings with, with deep sea harbors, abundancy, as, as you also know, of, of renewable energy in, in, in Norway. And because of Thank the you. future decrease, not now, I have to say that, so we don't make another issue of, of uh, Norway not being a provider of, of gas to, to Europe. Uh, but we know that the uh, decrease in the oil and gas industry will happen. So the Norwegian politics, politicians from the left to the right is all very supportive to this, uh, to this project because we need a, uh, job creation and we need the indu new industry development. And so the mining industry could be a part of that. So the stakeholder, the politicians, not both national and regional, are, are very supportive to this. And that's also thanks to thanks. Peter and his Thank people. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, you, you asked for the floor. Uh, may I uh, nevertheless uh, take up that question or that uh, remark from Ingvil? Um, in Norway, obviously, there is a consciousness and a willingness of the population that mining in Europe is, again, necessary. And they support it, obviously, there. And the areas there are not very much populated. How is it in uh, other countries in the world? What do you see when it comes to mining in Europe? Um, is there a change of attitude, or is there still a lot of resistance against new projects? But, but uh, also your point, please. Yeah, I have two points, uh, basically, and I'm happy to answer with regards to to the acceptance of mining as an industry in, in the developed markets, but I would also like to add a few points with regards to um, the timing of, my, of, my, of, of project development. Um, so with regards of acceptance um, in the industry and with the people, so the whole concept of ESG is not news to our industry. Mining has been do doing what is now subsumized under this term that was developed some 
five to ten years now in the making. Uh, for decades, we had interactions with the host communities forever. We always had, the, had an understanding of the responsibility towards our, the, the people and the communities and the environment. We called it social license to operate. Um, so the engagement that needs to happen before building a mine was, is always a, a core if of mining companies itself. And that needs to happen. It's a very actively managed process that needs to be institutionalized with the various uh, company it, itself. Um, so the engagement <coughs> process is something very important. And I personally, I also may not want to have a mine in the, in the backyard of my house, right? But uh, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. I think the understanding that the, the transition to the low carbon economy will not happen without mines is something that is not fully understood in my point of view, so it's an educational piece. And then when it comes to, um, to building a mine, the discussion with authorities and the licenses and their host countries is important, but it's equally important to interact and starting to interact very early on in the process before you set the first drill rig with the community surrounding. Now coming back a bit to, uh, to, the, to the timing and your question, how quickly will Ing will be producing? Depending on the commodity, building a mine takes 10 to 15 years. And that is not all bureaucracy and licensing, that's just a minor piece of it. It's just very diligent work that needs to go into building an economic mine. It's a lot of studies, a lot of work, a lot of people involved in bringing that on online. And it's a sometimes billion dollars investment. We're building an iron ore project in, uh, in Brazil at the moment. This is close to five billion dollars investment. Um, so, and you're not doing this for producing five years or three years, you're doing this with a horizon of 30 years life of mine. So if you combine that, when we sit here together today, we need to take an investment decision for the next 50 years. So mine in, in its core is a very long-term business and we're very happy to subscribe to any standards at the time of investment decision, but we also urge policymakers to after the time not change the rules of the game. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just to complete what you said, the biggest greenfield investment in copper uh, is the mine of Oyutolgoi in Mongolia. I remember it was decided by the end of last century. It took them 15 years to develop the first phase, and the second phase is not yet completed. So it's uh, more or less 20, 25 years later. Uh, and the second point I wanted to stress, uh, of course, France is not exactly the center of the world, but uh, uh, there won't be any mining in France, unfortunately. We had a project, by the way, it's not a strategic uh, uh, metal, it was gold in Guyana. You know, France has a small chunk of Latin America in Guyana. There was a project which was to, supposed to be a sustainable mine with all the precautions being taken in a country where we have a, a very a tough administration on that. It was the Montagne d'Or project in Guyana. And unfortunately, uh, it was uh, completely... Uh, a, it couldn't proceed because of the opposition, mainly of uh, uh, green NGOs, especially WWWF, uh, which was shared in France uh, by somebody who is by now uh, the chairman of the Environment Commission at the European Parliament. So that shows that uh, the NIMBY not in my backyard, uh, ID, uh, you have to take it at the size of a country and even on a continent. I'm very frankly doubtful about the capacity in Europe to develop new mining project, and uh, I'm happy to know that uh, Norway uh, could be an exception. Well, well Peter, that, uh, we, we want to give that question to you. Uh, can the EU do something? Will it do something to speed up processes that we don't have to wait 20 years? 
uh, given the present situation? And can it do something for raising the consciousness that, for instance, for this Green Deal, uh, we need uh, mining, more mining, also in Europe? Please. Yes, so what we cannot do is speed up the technical side of getting projects sure. up and running. And as the two previous speakers have said, you know, you actually have to work out the, the process models, you have to work out the geology, and it takes time to build facilities and bring them online. But where we do see huge uh, scope for improvement is speeding up the permitting processes. At the moment, um, in the European Union, and I think probably also in, in Norway, these are too slow too unpredictable, things get stuck, and uh, that's not the way to do it if you've got projects of strategic importance. So we're looking at best practices around the world and also at how we can improve things here. And we're talking very much to our environment colleagues uh, and those responsible for renewable energies because I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last few weeks we've proposed an emergency measure to push through the permitting of, of wind and solar projects because we absolutely need the, the ramp up of wind and solar in order to achieve our decoupling from Russian fossil fuels faster than, faster than originally planned. So we're gonna to have to look very much at what we can do on speeding up the permitting for, for mines or extraction sites or new industrial facilities. Um, and it means things like looking at creating a single a one-stop approach. It looks at parallel running of different permitting processes, having strategic impact assessment, uh, strategic environmental assessments before you start on the specific projects. It means nominating a coordinator who just makes sure that things don't get stuck and move forward expeditiously. And it also means making sure that you take a good close look at the judicial system so that there are no frivolous, uh, frivolous appeals which then get stuck in the court system for one, two or three years. There has to be a much more conscious approach to dealing with getting strategic projects uh, delivered without weakening environmental and social, social performance. Well, we have uh, three minutes left. Uh, that gives every one of you 45 seconds. You have uh, Mr. Raw Materials from the EU here. One message, what would you like to do the EU uh, to support you? What exactly do you need? Uh, I start with Ingvil, the politician. 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm not, uh, not yet a politician. I'd you stop being that when I join Norge Mining. I, I think the, the main topic here is, is to coordinate the process to have it much faster done. We have done the identification phase. We're into the sele selection phase. So what we need is, is the coordination. And of course, a, a united world to, to, to be producers and... and uh, demanders for sustain, uh, sustainable processes in the mining industry. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, we are founding members of an association called the Global Battery Alliance, together with the World Economic Forum, that is already 130 members from the public and the private space. And uh, we believe that a cooperation between the various entities, taking responsibility in our own hands, um, avoiding building parallel value chains, avoiding resource nationalism, but coming together in a joint effort in such a forum is the dominant strategy and we invite everyone um, to join our efforts. Thank you. Hey, Philippe. Well, uh, let's be positive. Uh, what is important in to be sustainable? Uh, with today's high prices, we have the means to be sustainable and perhaps to see is because one of the problem I uh, listened to what uh, uh, Peter said, uh, we more or less, we continue in Europe to export our environmental problems and to think that other will be, uh, uh, will produce and uh, I don't know in what condition it will be in uh, uh, DRC and so on. So with today's prices, we might be able to develop new sustainable mines, and I would say, perhaps in Europe, metallurgy, because we focused on, me on mine. Remember that the real um, good old étranglement, we say in French, so it, uh, my English doesn't come. The, the real problem is very often 
on the metallurgical side. Uh, uh, we didn't speak of titanium, but the problem is not the minerals, it's uh, the making of titanium sponge, for example. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this was a great discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to conclude with a quotation of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill in, 2000, uh, in 1914, when he was the first Lord of the British Admiralty, uh, said we have to change our whole fleet from coal to oil uh, as we want to compete with the German Navy. And then the Labour Party in Parliament said, well, that is insane because uh, then you make yourself re uh, uh, dependent on countries like Persia or today Azerbaijan uh, and that uh, we cannot accept. And then Churchill went again to the microphone in the, in the Houses of, Pol uh, Houses of uh, Commons and he said, well, trust me, energy security is about diversity diversity and diversity alone. And I think we can exactly say the same thing for critical raw materials. We have to look for diversity and with the help of the EU and Peter, we will be able to achieve it hopefully. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your uh, attendance. Uh, all the best and good luck to you in, with your projects.